we believe that this message will be a blessing to you so I want you to stay glued and watch to the end and share to bless others this is Christocentric we have a lot of Apostle Eric Nyamiche's message on our platform kindly check them out thank you for watching stay blessed I want to share with you what is in my heart as young people and even as adults because in 1984 I'd gone to Kaneshi Sports Complex I was sitting there around 2 p.m. I was there alone my house was close to the Kaneshi Sports Complex now called Azuma Nelson Sports Complex it is at North Kaneshi but whilst I was there alone meditating on God I heard this voice clearly know God for yourself know God for yourself it was so clear because those days we were moving about from one fellowship to another just following favorite preachers singing and jumping amongst the people but God who knows our end from our beginning knew what he wanted to use me for and it was not enough just moving from one fellowship to another in the midst of crowd jumping and dancing because he needed to speak to me have me make me so that I can be a blessing to a generation so today I just want to share with you knowing God as a father knowing God as a father so try and know God for yourself please know God for yourself don't just be in the crowd know God for yourself let me start from John chapter 14 verse 1 to 9 John 14 1 through 9 do not let your hearts be troubled you believe in God believe also in me my father's house has many rooms if that were not so would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. That is Jesus, full stop. But Thomas will, will speak. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? That is Thomas. Now Jesus will come in again. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you really know me, you will know my Father. You know my father as well. If you really know me, you know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now Philip will come in. Philip said, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. Not for me, for us. So what that means is that the disciples had certain inquiries. Some questions were on their mind. So he says that show us the Father and that will be enough for us. If you don't even show us the way, you show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Now, so, two disciples making some inquiries on behalf of the others. Thomas, as usual, who asked a question. Because when Jesus said, you know where I'm going, Thomas said, we don't know where you are going. Then Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. So Jesus answers this, and he says that you don't go to the Father and say through him. So he still brings to fore the Father, the Father, the Father. 
Then Philip comes on board. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. You forget about the question Thomas asked. Show us the way. You show us the Father. Because scripture says that where the Father is, then shall his people be. So you show us the Father. As for the way, certainly where he is, the sons will be there. So you don't worry about the way. Show us the Father, and that will be enough. One of the elders who raised me many years ago, he was such an interesting person, very humorous. He took the Bible at face value. And for him, he thought that this is the book God has written for all of us and that you don't need any sophistication to understand. One day he was preaching about heaven and then he says this. For him, he doesn't care whether heaven, the street is gold and there are 24 elders, 12 thrones. He doesn't care about that. His concern is to go to where the Father is. Because the Bible says that where the Father is, there shall the subjects be. So when he gets there and there are no five, 12 thrones, no problem. Once he has gotten there, <laughs> that's all. When he gets to heaven and the street is not good, no problem. So he's not going to preach about the streets of gold and all that. His concern is to go to where the Father is. Very simple ministry. Simple, but it is okay. Seek where the Father is. So he looks like he agrees with Philip. Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? I'm sure his response will be confused, Philip, the more. So, but these words from Jesus were not to rebuke the disciples, but to draw them closer to himself. He knew that he has not finished doing all that he has to do so far as they were concerned. There was much more for them to learn and to know. You see, the disciples knew Jesus before Pentecost as the one who gives them power over demons and power to preach. So many a times they were dependent on him to the extent that when he's not there, they were always found wanting, as in Mark chapter 9. Now when they descended from the Mount of Transfiguration, nine of the disciples were there, and they couldn't manage a demon-possessed child. They couldn't, because they have always depended on their master. Or when he sends them with power, they go. So when Jesus came, he was so sorry that up to that time, they couldn't just cast out demons. They were so dependent on him. Our Lord's greatest desire is for us to enter into a closer relationship with him. The greatest desire of our Lord is not for us to be singing about him, to be preaching about him, but to enter into a closer relationship with him. It is a joy to Jesus when a disciple takes time to walk more intimately with him. It is a joy. If you are a pastor here, the joy of Jesus is not for you to be called into the full-time ministry. It's for you to walk closer and closer to him. Closer to him. That is his joy. It is in that closet that he will make you for his people, walking closer with him. Jesus is today inviting all of us, apostles, prophets, young ones, teenagers, Sunday school people, to come closer to him. He knows how to speak to Eli and to speak to young Samuel as well. He wants all of us to walk closely to him and to know him for ourselves and to know him as the Father. As the Father. Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. See, Philip's desire was to know the Father 
Jesus speaks about so he can connect to him and probably be like Jesus. There was something about this Jesus that the disciples, I believe, desired. And they wanted to be like him. So they wanted to connect to the Father he speaks about so they can be like him. For him, that would be enough. Knowing the Father would be enough. The inquiry, Thomas, may be necessary, and I agree. And I think Jesus does agree to the inquiry Philip and Thomas were making. is necessary for all of us. So I want you to join me in this expedition. There are levels of knowing God. Even the apostle Paul said that I may know him. So none of us can possibly know all about God. So don't come to a point where you think that you have arrived. No, not at all. Don't even make statements that project that you are a kind of a champion. Don't try that because you are not. God is much more than what we know. So I'm inviting all of you to join us to explore into the greatness of God, knowing him today as a father. Now, Luke chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Luke chapter 11, 1 and 2. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples, verse 2. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Now, I believe the disciples were not just attracted to prayer, but to Jesus' lifestyle. Now, I want to say that again. They were not just attracted to prayer. They didn't just want to pray. But something was driving them to make this request. They could figure out that maybe the kind of lifestyle the master portrayed might have something to do with his prayer life, his closeness with the one he calls father. So one day when he was on his knees, when he just finished praying, they said, teach us to pray. Now you need to know how to pray aright so that you don't pray amiss. But the essence is not knowing the how to pray. The essence is to pray. Sometimes you can go to a Bible school and the lecturers will be teaching you how to pray. And some of them will be against all sort of prayer. Some of them will even be against praying and holding your ears. Some of them will be against praying and lifting your legs. Some of them will be against praying and shouting. They say, ah, is God possibly deaf? They'll be making all this argument, but they themselves, they never pray. So the disciples are saying, teach us to pray. Not how to be praying. We need a how. But prayer is prayed. Yeah. Prayer is prayed. Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. His closeness to the one he calls father, certainly the disciples believe, has impacted his life. And they want to be like him. So teach us to pray to be praying as you do. See, prayer is not just communicating with God. No, prayer is not justice. You can start with this definition. But the importance of communication is to build relationship. Importance of communication is to build relationship. The intimacy people derive from relationship causes them to share certain character traits. <laughs> the intimacy people derive in relationship causes them to share certain character traits. Sometimes, I clap like my wife does. But when I come to my sense, I realize I'm clapping like she's doing, I, I stop. <laughs> I stop clapping. But you see, you clap like she does. 
as long as you live together, you grow up together, and you do all things together, you'll be sharing some character traits. That is why you don't need to marry too many women. What will happen is that in marriage, you lose your identity into each other. So it will come a time that you'll be lost because the women are too many. Huh? You'll be lost. If you like ask Solomon, he will explain some of these things to you. <laughs> How he got lost. <laughs> he couldn't even find a place where Yahweh, the God of Israel, was. Because the women, they've changed his identity. So we lose into each other. So when we are talking about they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, what that means is that they that wait upon the Lord shall exchange their strength with his strength. So he takes our weakness and he imparts strength to us. So relationships, close relationships and intimacy causes us to share character traits. So his request to teach us to pray or something more than just kneeling and making supplication to God. They saw Jesus like Nicodemus saw Jesus, a man from heaven, a man from heaven. So when he was doing things that they were not doing, they were always figuring out how to become like him. So maybe, maybe it has to do with his closeness. Early before dawn, Mark 1, 35, we say that he will rise and go to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Now, when you are talking about Jesus, you cannot say he read the Bible, because he himself is the word. So any time that we are talking about, we talk about his prayer life. But we are not saying that you don't read the word, because when he goes before God, it is the word in front of God. And so he was not reading the Bible. He is the word. But for us, we need the word, and we need the prayer. Luke 6, verse 12. Yes, let's read this one. Luke 6, 12. Can we read together? Ready, go. One of those, Jesus went out to a mountainside too and spent the night praying to God. One man spending the whole night to a mountainside, not a beautiful place like this. Mountainside, just check the conditions. But he was there praying all night, praying all night with the Lord, before the Lord, before the Lord. So the disciple, when he was praying all night, where was Peter? Yeah, where was Philip? Where was Thomas? So they figured that Baumis, his character, what he does, this man from heaven, has something that we needed, his closeness to the one he calls Father. Now, so he taught them how to pray. But let me take what he said in Luke eleven two from Matthew 6, 9. The Matthew 6, 9 one is more popular, and I like that one too. Matthew 6, 9. Shall we read together? Ready, go. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So we are looking at the request that Philip made. Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And that will be enough for us. Now, Jesus said, when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You realize that if you have to take the Lord's Prayer and then you are praying it, it doesn't actually work out that way. So it was a teaching and an encouragement to pray. A teaching and an encouragement to pray. And a revelation of what it means to be praying. Now he's saying that when you stand to pray, know that you are praying to a father not a force. And that father is in heaven. Now, so when you close your eyes and you are praying, you are not just speaking into the air. You are actually talking to a father. And that father, he says, is in heaven. Jesus here is revealing that the father that Philip wanted to know 
Is he Jesus' father, Philip's father, and our father? No. Because he says, when you pray, say our father. So when he said, say our father, he was not taking himself out of it. It means that the father who is our father is his father. So when Philip says, show us the father, and that will be enough, Jesus is saying here that my father is your father, and he is our father. Our father. Number two, our father is the father he wants Philip to know and all of us to know today is he is alive. He is not dead. See, when you pray, say, our Father, who is in heaven. So God is, and he is not dead. From the prayer, Jesus reveals the Father as the source of our supplies and provision. So he is saying that he is a Father. Why? He is the source of our supplies and provision. In fact, it is in him we live, move, and have our being, our Father in heaven, our Father in heaven. He is the source of our supply. Now, when he moved on, he said, give us this day our daily bread. Who will give us the bread? It is the Father who is the source of our provision and our supply. So he is connecting the disciples to God for them to know that he is the source of their provision, their strength. Every supply they need is from the Father. Another point is this. That God is not just a force somewhere, but someone we can relate to. Once he said, Father in heaven, then he's saying that God is not a wind. God is not light. God is not sound, like some other religions want us to believe. Light and sound. God is not knowledge, like the satanic movement want us to believe. God is not just knowledge. No. God can be related to. He is our father. No. I'm not saying he is a father. I'm saying he is our father. He is our father. Now another point is this. From his prayer, the relationship is a father-son relationship. Now, the relationship is a father-son relationship or a father-daughter relationship, father-child relationship. Now, having said this, let me take the big one from here. God is not a grandfather. God is not a grandfather. Any song that we sing that seems to portray that God is a grandfather is theologically wrong. How many of you can give me one or two of such songs? Any song that seems to suggest that God is a grandfather? God is not Nana. You see, but somehow you are tempted to say Nana because if God is my father, then it should be my child's grandfather. But it's not like that. He is a father to my son, my daughter, as well as a father to me. What this means is this. We all have access to him, just like Jesus has. God is a father. So we all have access. He's not a grandfather. You don't need to talk to your father before you talk to him. Straight answers to him. God is not a grandfather. He is our father and Jesus' father. He is Jesus' God and our God. He is Jesus' God and our God. Let's read John chapter 20, verse 17. John 20, 17. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. To the Father. 
Go instead to my brothers. So every one of us, including the Philips and the Peters and the Thomases, are brothers of Jesus. So that if God is his father, then all of us are children of God. Direct access to the father. And tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father. To my God and your God. I'm sure some of you are from, many of us, as you say, especially the young people, are from Christian homes. But you need to know God for yourself. Your father may be a pastor, but know God for yourself as a father. Because you have direct access to God, just as your father has direct access to God. So God is not a grandfather. He is our father and Jesus' father. He is Jesus' God and our God. We all have equal access to him. And he dwells in heaven. He dwells in heaven. You see, when you say God, the Father dwells in heaven, I'll try and explain a little about he dwells in heaven. But let's read 2 Chronicles 6. 2 Chronicles 6 from verse 1. This is after Solomon has built the beautiful edifice for God. And he was praying the prayer of dedication. And I want us to read together if you can. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in a dark cloud. I have built a magnificent temple for you, a place for you to dwell forever. Now, I have built what? Now, let's take this verse 2 again. I have built a magnificent temple for you. That is you, Father God. A place for you to dwell forever. Now, let's jump to verse 18. For the sake of time, to verse 18. But will God really dwell on earth with humans? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. He himself said, I've built a place for you. Come and be here forever. And then he comes back to say that, will God (laughs) fit into this temple? The Bible says heaven is his throne. So if you like, that is where his bottles is. And the earth is his footstool. And now how many of you? Now if heaven is his throne, it's not so. This part up to the bottles is sitting in heaven. And his leg is very long. And the earth is his footstool. So let's go back to verse 18. Okay, so we have read verse 18. Let's take 19. Yet, Lord, yet, Lord, my God, give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence. Verse 20. May your eyes be opened towards this temple day and night, This place of which you said you will put your name there. May you hear the prayers your servant prays towards this place. 21. Hear the supplication of your servants and of your people, Israel. When they pray towards this place, hear from, hear from your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. So even Solomon knew that God is in heaven. And then when we build temples for him, his name is upon the temple. And he's pleading that he should hear the supplications people make in the temple. God does not live in temples made of men. But you see, he dwells in heaven, yet God is spirit. So the heaven cannot possibly contain him. So his dwelling place is in heaven, but he fills the universe. And you see, the irony is that the universe is also in his hands. That is the problem. Mm -hmm. That is the matter we are all contending with. God dwells in heaven. 
yet he fills the universe. Meanwhile, the whole world is in his hands. That is a problem. But the good thing is that this great man is our father. He's our father. He is our father. Another point I want to make, that if he is our father, then we are all members of his household. We are all members of his household. 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. 1 Timothy 3, 14, 15. Although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So when you are talking about the church of God, it is God's household. So all of us are in God's house because God is our father and we are all children of God in his house. All of us are brothers and sisters. The church is the household of God and he is the head of the family. Now if he is the head of the family and all of us are his children and he is our father, then I want to say that we are named after him and that we bear his name. We are named after him and that we bear his name. Ephesians 3.14 But let us read from the King James Version or 1984 NIV. If you have not the 2011 NIV, the 1984 version of the NIV. For, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the... You see, when we talk about father, the father is one. Fathers are many. Me, I'm a father. But <laughs> we are trying to be like the father. So we are not correct fathers. <laughs> and sometimes, when we say God is father, don't compare him with the behavior of your father. Otherwise, you will miss it. That is why Jesus refers to him as the father, the one who reveals the true fatherhood, not, uh, not the one you know. Eh? Not the one you know. So don't get disappointed. Some people, their fathers will slap them when they need something. They will push them aside. They wouldn't mind them. And I'm not talking about that one. I'm talking about God, the father. Now, so verse 15, verse 15, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read on. So verse 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The whole family. So God has a household. He has a family. Where can we find them? Some are in heaven and some are on earth. That is why he's saying the whole family. If you read the NIV, the latest version, it says every family. But it's not every family. There are some families who are not part of the family of God. But he said the whole family in heaven and on earth, whoever dies joins the family in heaven. Any believer who passes on joins the family in heaven. Those of us who are alive are God's family on earth. So you don't cease to be a family of God, even in death. That is why we, we do not die. We just enter into the Father's presence. So the whole family... We are named after God. And so, some of you, you uh, maybe have to let you know your names. Eh? How many of you are children of God? He says the whole family in heaven and on earth is named. Now, when you come to my house and you meet my children, and you ask them to give, them, give, give their names, uh, they will not possibly say, Nyamiche. Especially when I'm seated there. 
This one say, I'm Samuel, I'm Papa Che, I'm Lucien, I'm Mami. They will just say that. They will expect that you should know that they are so, 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 Yeah. And all of us, we bear God's name. That is why we are Christians, Christians. And for all of you, your real surname has Yehoah, Yehoah to it. <laughs> So, 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 Yehoah. Okay, Yehoah. When we say Yehoah, and Kasano, and the wager. And so, please put these things in your spirit. Know God as a father. Know that you bear his name because you are a member of God's household. All humanity are God's creation, but not all are part of his family, not at all. We are Christians, a people belonging to Christ. That is why the spirit and the bride says, come, come. The spirit and the church is inviting all of us because we are part of God's household. We are part of God's household. Ours is to respond and come to him and get closer to him. The Christian who is truly intimate with the Father never draw attention to himself, but will only show evidence of a life where Jesus is completely in control. Now, any Christian who is so intimate with the Father, it gets closer and closer to the Father, will not draw attention to himself, but will show evidence of a life where Jesus is completely in control. He will show evidence. Now, if you are closer to Christ, show by your way of life, the way you speak. Why am I saying this? The bearing of fruit is always shown in Scripture to be visible resource of an intimate relationship with the Father God. The bearing of fruit it's as a result of an intimate relationship with the Father God. John chapter 15 says this, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He casts off every branch in me that does not bear fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will even be more, what? Fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, Galatians 5.22 says that, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law that will rise against it. No. So show the evidence of your intimacy with God, the Father, with your fruitfulness. The picture resulting from such a life is that of strong, calm balance that our Lord and Father gives to those who are intimate with him. Strong, well-grounded, calm and balanced life that he gives to those who are intimate with him. We need a closer walk with God. And God is even calling us to go beyond just being children to being friends. John 15, 15. John 15, 15. You can write that test down. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. So Jesus wants us to go beyond seeing uh, God as father and becoming friends with the father friends with him. God does not want us to relate to him only as a father, but he wants us to get closer so we are like friends, a child friend. True friendship is rare on earth. It means identifying with thoughts, hearts, and spirit. When you're a friend with somebody, sometimes you can read a person's mind because you know, you are accustomed to the pattern of thinking. And sometimes you know how their hearts even read. 
He wants to share his thoughts and his heart with us. He wants us to enter into his counsel. True friendship is beyond just seeing God as a father. I work with one area ahead. And he's gone beyond being my father to being my friend. Yeah. And when we meet, I see him as my father because I worked with him. I worked under him. But we talk like friends. I'm nowhere close to him in terms of age, but we are friends. We talk about anything, anything, anything. Yeah. When he buys a book, you buy a copy for me, even at my age. <laughs> and then when I go, I, say, I bought these books for you. I'll collect them. Yeah, I'll collect them. Buying books for me. So I'm praying for you. How are you? One day I was not well. And then when I said I was not well, I know the previous day I had called him. I, I didn't, he didn't know that I wasn't that well. I called him and I realized that he wasn't well. He told me his head and all that. The following day he came to me. You are not well. You are coming to see me who is also not well. <laughs> yeah. You see, we want you to have a relationship with God which will go just not seeing God as a father, but as a friend. The spirit and the church is calling you, come. Come, make time and get closer to God. You see, some people did it and you can do it. Second Chronicles 20 verse 7. Second Chronicles 20 verse 7. Now, our God, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land? before your people Israel and gave it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. Abraham, your friend. That is why in Genesis 18, 17, the Lord said this. Then the Lord said, Genesis 18, 17, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Because he wants to share his thoughts with Abraham, his friend. So we can also become God's friends, just beyond seeing him as a father. Now, let's go back to the fact that he is our father and that we bear his name. The second part of Matthew 6, 9 says that, Hallowed be your name. Now, because we bear his name, and we are people of the household of God. Because he is our father, we have to hallow his name. To hallow is to honor as holy. To honor as holy. You honor the name as holy. See, just lift your heads and look at me if you can. A name is not just for identification. Our names stands in for us. You sometimes your lawyer can represent you in court. You don't have to be there dealing with the case in your name. So your lawyer is representing you, but it is your name that they are dealing with. So your name will always stand in for you. You and your name are one. So you, you are not different from your name. You and your name are one. If you destroy a person's name, you destroy the fellow. So be careful. When people are talking ill about other people, maligning them here and there, be very careful. There are some who are so malicious. So when somebody is trying to say bad things about someone, be careful. If you destroy the person's name, you are destroying the fellow. All of us should carry ourselves well so that our names are not destroyed while we are still alive. Because your name stands for you. When your name is destroyed while you are still alive, you could be useless. Because they have destroyed your name. Meanwhile, you are not dead. Because they've destroyed you a long time, but you are still alive. So carry yourself well. Please carry yourself well. What I don't like is for people to use my name 
to make announcements when I'm not away. It's for people to use my name to call meetings when I'm not away. <laughs> this man said this when I have not said it. I don't like it at all because you are destroying my name. When I was an area head somewhere and somewhere, there was one day that this presbyter met me and said that, Apostle, we always wait for you and you don't come. So wait for me. Oh, even yesterday we waited for the presbytery meet. Pastor says you come and you didn't come. We always wait for you. <laughs> I understood what she was saying. I couldn't say it. So when I met the pastor, I said, Pastor, how, how did the announcement go? Why did you use my name to tell the people to come for a meeting and that I will be there when you know that I will not be there? So if I don't say that, it, it, they won't come. With the meeting to two at home, Bonnie. <laughs> but you see, there's something about a name. When God said, I will make your name great to Abraham, and he says, you will be a blessing. When your name becomes great, people can use your name for announcement. Yes, but they should be careful. Otherwise, the same announcement can destroy your name. So be careful. I'm talking about hallowing the name of God. So I'm just talking about names so that you know what it means to hallow the name of the Lord. As children of God, we should remember that we bear God's name. And therefore, we need to consciously hallow the name. Everything we do have effects on his holy name. That is why sometimes when you don't carry yourself well, your friends will say, you say you are a Christian. If they said, you say you are Eric Nyameche, that would be fine. But they will say, you say you are a Christ in. So they push Christ to your name. And you are bringing a disgrace to that name that must be held holy. Now, God knew this. That is why he said somewhere. Um, I'll just talk about, there was this child who was asked, about the opposite of the Lord's Prayer. What is the opposite of the Lord's Prayer? It says, the Lord is my shepherd. Yeah. And so let's go to Psalm 23. <laughs> let's take the opposite of the Lord's Prayer because we are dealing with our Father in heaven. So let's go to the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along what? Right path for his name's sake. So that his name is hallowed. That is why God always wants to lead that in path of righteousness. So that people will praise his name, not to speak against his name. So that the name of the Lord will be attractive. We need to hallow his name. Paul did it and we can do it. Galatians 1, 24, Paul says that, and they praise God because of me, because of the way I carried myself. They praise God because of me. This did not just happen. It was his determined purpose. I said what? It was his determined purpose that he will hallow the name of the Lord. How do I know this? Philippians 1 verse 20. Philippians 1 20. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be what? Christ will be what? Exalted in my body whether by life or by death. So he has determined that as Christ will be glorified in his body, whether he is alive or he's dead, it was a determined purpose. So all of us should determine that we will hallow his name by whatever we do. The Lord's name should be hallowed. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I'll take this last test. And 
a very important conclusion. 1 Peter 3, verse 15. If we can have it from the amplifier, I'll be grateful. But in your heart, what? Set Christ apart as holy, acknowledging him, giving him first place in your life as Lord. I only need the first part. So let us go into it again. But in your heart, in your heart, if God is your father and his name is upon you, then Peter is saying that in your heart, set Christ apart. Set him apart as holy, acknowledging him, giving him what? First place in your lives as Lord. Give him the first place in your life as Lord. So God is our father. He is Jesus' father and our father. He is Philip's father and our father. He is Jesus' God and our God. Because we bear his name, we need to honor the name. We need to set the name as holy. We need to hallow the name. We all have direct access to God, the Father. He is not a grandfather. So we all have access to him. And he's inviting us for a closer walk. You may be an apostle. He's inviting you for a closer walk. Because Paul even said, I want to know him. That is Jesus' desire. That we all come closer to him as a father. We are people of his household. We are members of his family. And we bear his name. 